So we are in a series called Real Jesus. We are rediscovering the life, message, and mission of Jesus. Last or two weeks ago, I discussed that our theology, our study of God, is shaped by um, our interpretation of the scripture, by our traditions, um, the tradition we come from in his, uh, Christian circles and Christian streams. Uh, it's shaped by our culture. It's shaped by our personal experiences. It's shaped by our local church. Um, and of, of course, it's shaped by the Holy Spirit. So when we talk about God and our view of what God is like or what Jesus is like, we're, we're, we're being influenced by all different types of things. Would, does that make sense? And so what I shared a couple of weeks ago is that many of us have views of God already. We have views of Jesus, an image of Jesus in our head, but many of us also have distorted views. We carry around broken views of God that are inaccurate. And um, this series is really about rediscovering who Jesus is really is. And I believe he's the most interesting man to ever live in human history. That in Jesus, God became flesh and made his dwelling among humanity. He entered into the human realm and he cast out demons. He healed the sick. He, uh, he, he calmed storms. He fed the hungry. Uh, he raised the dead. He, was re- he died in human history and he's been resurrected in human history and now lives and reigns over all of the cosmos. This is the Jesus that we know, this is the God that we have come to believe in at this church, but in what we call Christianity. And so as we kind of move forward in this series, I wanna start with the message of Jesus Christ. What was the message of Jesus? What is the message of Jesus? And how do we, how do we come back to a better understanding of what that message is all about? Because when Jesus comes onto the scene, it says that he proclaimed the gospel, When Paul goes around the Roman Empire, planting cities in different contexts with different deities, pagan practices, different religious views, different political views, he goes into these cities as a Jew saying gospel, which means good news. You see, and that's essential for us as Christians. Christianity, its first message was understood as good news. It was an announcement to the world about something that took place that changed everything and was going to change everything else. And you had to align yourself with that announcement that Paul was crazy enough to go to different places around the world proclaiming the Jewish God is the only one true living God. And that this was good news. So I want to talk about the message of Jesus this morning. Um, And for us to understand his message, there's really two things we need to know this morning. We need to know the bigger story because the gospel only makes sense in in the, the big story, I'll say, in the greater story. And we also need to know context. So the two things I'm going to attempt to do today is give you a bigger story and context to the message of Jesus. And next week we'll look at something else. Are you with me? Okay, so... uh, Let's just begin. And I just want to say, the, the re, I'm really passionate about this, as you can already tell, but I'm really passionate about it because I was sitting at, on 2nd Street at dinner on Friday night, and there was a man, um, not from this context, walking the streets, shouting out loud, repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. He's going around proclaiming Jesus, saying repent and believe in the gospel. And the reason I'm passionate about this is because when you say that without context, it really misses the point. Because for many of us, the gospel is simply something that we believe in so that we go to heaven when we die. Or the gospel is a genre of music, (sighs) a really good genre of music, which we like. (laughs) Or the gospel has become for many Christians today, just some advice. Live this way, um, you know, fix your marriage with these gospel truths, right? You know, have gospel truth in your finances. And that's not at all what the gospel was. That's not the gospel that Jesus was preaching, I guess. Because I believe the good news is better than that. You with me? So let's just pick up. I'm going to just, uh, you're going to need a Bible or you're going to be really good on your phone or iPad or whatever, because I've copied and pasted all the verses and there's a lot of verses I'm going to go through. So um, you're going to get, just get some practice today, which is great. Um, and we, we love the scriptures at the Garden Church. We believe, um, we, want to re, we want to orient our lives around the scriptures. They're inspired by God. They're, they're, they're life-giving. And we want, to, we want to understand what the Bible says and live our lives accordingly. So let's begin in Matthew 4. I'm just going to give you a quick overview. 
of the primary message of Jesus. So this is, this is Matthew's version um, of, of what the, one of the gospel writers. This is his version of what Jesus' message was about. It comes right after Jesus was baptized in the story of Matthew and right after he was tested in the desert. And then it says this in Matthew chapter 4, We'll start at verse 17. And if you don't want to pull out your Bible, if you're too lazy to get on your phone because you don't have the app, or if you're just new to this whole thing, you're blessed if you're new to this whole thing, okay? So you have, don't take any of my sarcastic jokes about the Bible. If you're new to the scriptures, you can thumb your way. It's going to be a lesson today. But Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, this, the, the message will be on the screen. From that time on, Jesus began to preach. And this is in quotes. This is what Jesus preached. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. So that's his message. Verse uh, 23, Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news or gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. So if you're new to this thing, the Greek word uh, gospel uh, for good news is also the English word gospel. And it means a um, uh, 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 good news, of course. It's, it's euangelion. It's the Hebrew, uh, Greek word where we get the word evangelism. Um, but this is Jesus's message. He's announcing the good news of the kingdom. Um, go to Mark chapter one, and we're going to kind of anchor here. And this will be the text that I use for the next three weeks. Um, I'm going to focus on a few words and give you all sorts of fun stuff with it. So Mark chapter one, verse 14. So again, in Mark's version of the gospel, the story of Jesus, um, we see that Jesus is baptized. He's filled with the Holy Spirit and then he's tested in the wilderness and then it goes on and then he begins his public ministry. So this is the message of Jesus according to Mark, a different um, writer of one of the accounts of Jesus's life. Verse 14, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. Verse 15, the time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Repent and believe the gospel. That man on Friday night that was quoting scripture, he was quoting this verse. Repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe the good news. So Jesus' Jesus's message is made up of three parts I want to talk about. The first is time. The second is kingdom. And the third is repent and believe. That, those words together, it's important that we put those together. So over the next several weeks, I'm going to talk about time. Today, I'm going to talk about time. To, next week, I'm going to talk about the kingdom. And then after that, we're going to talk about repent and believe. So what did Jesus mean when he said, the time has come? That's the question I want to answer today. And this is why we need a bigger story and much more context to understand how electrifying, how powerful this proclamation really was 2,000 years ago as a Jewish man named Jesus of Nazareth goes around this small hick town in Galilee announcing the time is fulfilled or the time is now. It's, it's now fulfilled. It has come. So there's a different, uh, I want to talk about what, what kind of time was he talking about? So let's just begin. In Greek, there's two different words for time. There's chronos, which is sequ sequential time. So after nine o'clock, there's 10 o'clock and then 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock. That's sequential. Um, but then there's another word for time. It's kairos. And kairos is opportune time. It's a specific time. It's not logical or it's not linear. It's about specific time in history, something you would expect. For example, a few years ago, we found out my wife was pregnant. Good news. That was awesome. Um, but what that set was a, a series of events that we would follow, like learning a whole new different language. Because if you get pregnant and you have kids, there are words like bumbo. There are, uh, there are different types of strollers, joggers, uh, 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 convertible strollers. I don't even know all the languages uh, here. Uh, there's, there's just like a whole new type of experience that you have when, you, when you're preparing to have a child for the first time. You baby-proof your home. You read all sorts of books sometimes, um, or your wife does, and she gives you the cliff notes. Um, <laughs> No, I read some of them. Uh, uh, you, you, you begin taking classes. You learn how to go through, you know, how you, you're going to deliver this child. Well, I'm not, but she's going to deliver, deliver this child. And I'm just as responsible and I'm suffering just as much, obviously. And so I'm... <laughs> 
I'm preparing to be the coach or whatever it is. And, uh, but so you, 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 you wait for all this experience and you're waiting for a specific opportune time. And I remember um, through the process, you know, Ezra was breached. And so on, we had to schedule a C-section because he was stubborn even back then. He wanted to stay upright, you know, and sit in his position and come at his time. And, and sure enough, he did. And he's an amazing child. We love him. But he, uh, true to form in the, in the womb, he was, he is outside. But the point is this, we were scheduled a C-section for November 18th, um, 2013. And what we had done is we prepared all sorts of stuff. And my, my wife made all sorts of casserole dishes. She froze. We were preparing for her to be, you know, out of uh, cooking for a while. And so I, would, I wouldn't go hungry. It was r- really for me. But anyway, so she prepared for me <laughs> now that I think about it. But that time came. Uh, the, November 17th was the last day of work. I had preached that Sunday, and we were, we were preparing for that day. So that, that happened, and I was going to go on uh, like a four, four or five-week break so I can be with our boy and, and just be around and experience that whole thing. And as November 17th came, we went to sleep that night, and I get woken up in the middle of the night. My wife is pacing, and she says, it's time. And I'm like, wait. She, she went into labor. Now, when she says it's time, I did not think it's time to wake up. It's time for dinner. We're going on a date. I knew exactly in that moment that it was time for her to deliver the baby. She went into labor, even though we had a scheduled C-section. And so in that moment, I get up, I grab our bag, I run to the car frantic. She's so calm, breathing patiently. I'm running around for everything. <laughs> and, and it was that time we knew that the baby was coming. And we had to get to the hospital. There were all sorts of expectations. There were all sorts of sorts of uh, ideas that, that came around, anticipation around this event, which would be the day of my son's birth. And sure enough, that's what, what Jesus is talking about when he says it's time. It had all sorts of expectations. It had all sorts of, of hope and excitement, anticipation of what was about to happen because deep into the Jewish mind, every single Jewish boy and girl in Galilee at that time would have known exactly what time Jesus was referring to when he said, the time has come. It was not a mystery to them because it was rooted into their narrative, into their history, into their story as a people. You with me? So Jesus says the time has come. What was the time that he was referring to? It's in the Old Testament and it refers to the age to come or the day of the Lord. And I want you to, to write this down because what I love about what we're gonna, what we're gonna see through Jesus's life is he fulfills so much of the Old Testament. What I love about Christianity, and to be honest, what brought me back to the Christian faith when I left the Christian faith, when I rejected it, was that Christianity is rooted in history. It's not just some isolated events that took place with some individuals who wrote about that one experience. It traces back into human history, into the story of Judaism and all the Jewish people. And it tra- it, it f- it's fulfilled in Christ and it continues on with a bunch of Jews who were converted to Christianity and write the New Testament. It's amazing. It's, I, I'm, I'm excited about that. Okay. Um, <laughs> And so, so Jesus comes around and he says the time is fulfilled and he is referring to the day of the Lord um, and, and a phrase called the age to come, which was a very particular time that was promised by the Old Testament writers, the prophets. And so everyone would have known what to expect and we have to understand the greater story. So here's the story that is rooted in the Old Testament that was being fulfilled in Jesus's life in the announcement of what is to come. So I want you to write down these phrases, these words as, we've moved for, as we move forward. You know the story, and if you're here for the first time, here's the story, and then we'll get to the context. The story is this, that all of creation begins in Genesis, right? God creates the universe in six days. He says it's good. Creates humans. He says it's very good. On the seventh day, he rests. God creates humanity to live in perfect relationship with himself. Um, Creation is working in perfect harmony with everything. Everything's working out. Uh, People are in right relationship with each other, with God and themselves. That's the picture in Genesis is shalom. But we know that sin enters into the world. And what sin does is we rebel against God and the cosmos... Uh, are vandalized, you could say. Shalom was vandalized. That perfect picture of us living in perfect harmony with God is ruined. But God doesn't just start over with creation. What you read in Genesis is that God enters into the story. He selects a group of people called the Israelites through a man named Abraham. 
Genesis chapter 12. And he says, you're going to be a tribe for me, a group of people that bless all the other nations and people on the earth. That's where the story takes off. But then the story takes off and write down Egypt. Because in the book of Exodus, I'm going to go through the whole Old Testament with me. (laughs) All right. Stay right here, okay? Don't leave. (laughs) In the book of Exodus, the Israelites were slaves for Egypt for 430 years. And they cry out to God, save us, redeem us. You promised that you would save us. And he does. He, th- he sends Moses to them and he, he liberates them from the oppressive foreign ruling, ruling power of Egypt. And he lets, uh, he's, you know, Moses says, let my people go. And eventually through plagues and the power of God, e- uh, the Israelites come out of Egypt and enter into Sinai. Remember Mount Sinai? There's a, there's a mountain that God takes the people of Israel to and, and there he makes a covenant with them in Exodus chapter 19. Look at what God does. He frees the group, uh, a nation of slaves and he says to them, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt. Now how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now if you listen to this, this is, this is the covenant he makes. If you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, You will be my treasured possession. You will be what I cherish most. Although the whole earth is mine, God says, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So God takes a tribe of slaves and makes a special relationship with them. And he says, you guys are my people. And I'm going to make you a holy nation. I'm going to set you apart from all other people on earth. And you will be a kingdom of priests. In other words, your task is to represent me to the rest of the world if you obey my commands. The story continues. God gives the people of Israel a promised land, gives them a city and a king named David who secures the borders of the promised land. And there King David has a a heart after God. And in Jerusalem, the city and the people of God are established. One generation after David, it already goes south. The son of David, who's the son of David? Solomon, we got some Bible readers, awesome. But who else? Well, check this out. The son of David builds a temple for God's presence to dwell. And remember, his job is to represent the God to the rest of the people. And the people of God are representing God to the rest of the nations. And it says that Solomon has 700 wives. God says, if you obey me fully, you will be a treasured possession. Solomon has 700 wives and a bunch of concubines. And it says in the scripture that his heart was not fully devoted to God. And generation after generation, the people of Israel reject God. The kings rebel against God. They worship other idols. They forget their covenant they made at Mount Sinai. Are you with me? This is the, the, the entire Old Testament in 10 minutes. You're getting your money's worth today. For those of you, <laughs> for those of you that tie, thank you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I really am kidding. I don't really care about that. King after king. Um, and, then, and then so God, God calls, sends some prophets to call the people of Israel to repent. And, um, and they don't repent. So God sends Babylon, a northern foreign superpower, and they come in and completely decimate Jerusalem. They destroy the temple. They take Israelites captive to a foreign place once again. And the nation of Israel once again find themselves in exile and slaves to a foreign superpower. And in their mindset, they were God's people. They were the chosen ones. They were there uh, on earth, set apart from all their nations. And here, these foreign rulers with foreign gods come and destroy the temple of God, the temple of Yahweh, and take them out of their promised land to another place and just decimate not only their view, but their lives. But it's there in Babylon. And you need to know Babylon. It's there in Babylon that the prophets of the Old Testament begin to speak and dream about a time when God would enter back into human history. A time when God would come and like Exodus of the old with Moses, he would liberate his people again, once and for all. But what the, the, new, uh, the Old Testament writers write about is they talk about not just God freeing all of Israel, but God coming back into human history and liberating anyone and everyone that has been oppressed. Talks about a time that was better and bigger than Exodus. It would be like a new Exodus 
where God would come in and make the world right. He would rescue the people of God and set them free and life would be restored once and for all. In the Old Testament, they they promised a time when God would do that. And guess what? The Israelites are freed from Babylon. They go back home. They build the temple. They build the walls. They rebuild it. And and, and as they come back in from exile, they recognize that what the Old Testament writers promised, what the prophets prophesied about, didn't actually take place. They were expecting the age to come, the day of the Lord where they would be vindicated. The the foreign superpowers would be crushed. God would make peace on all the earth. They're waiting for that. But the last book of the Old Testament ends and it ends with this hope after they come back to Jerusalem. They recognize they're still in some type of spiritual exile and they're awaiting God's arrival. And the, the, the the Old Testament writers say that God's going to come back and do this thing. And they sit there waiting for a Messiah, waiting for a messenger, waiting for God to do the thing he promised he would do for all people. The Old Testament ends and there's 400 years of silence. 400 years between the Old Testament and New Testament. And Jesus comes and he says, the time has come. All that you were waiting for, the culmination of human history is at hand hand. You can reach out and touch it. Everything that I promised, what God promised, all of what the Old Testament writers said would happen is here and now. It's in your midst, in my presence. This is what was so electrifying with Jesus's message. When he says the time, he's referring to a very specific time. And so that's the story, the story of where we catch up with a group of people that are waiting for God to do the thing he promised he would do. But what was the thing he promised he would do? Let's read this because I want you to see the gospel in the Old Testament. Are you with me? So go to Isaiah. This is where you need to get really good at your Bible. We're going to go to Isaiah chapter two. We're going to start at the left and work our way through the Old Testament prophets. I want you to see the context. And this is, this is important for next week as we talk about the kingdom of God. But the day of the Lord, what is the day of the Lord? What is the age to come? Well, there's all sorts of writings uh, and prophets that wrote about it in the Old Testament that promised various things. So let's just look at Isaiah chapter two, verse two. That will be on the screen. I'm going to read this and we're going to go through a chunk of the Old Testament. So just bear with me as I read through this. In the last days, what are the last days? The age to come. He's referring to the specific time when God's going to act. act. It's, you're going to read on that day, when the time comes, in that time, in those days. It's all referring to the same concept, the age to come and the day of the Lord. So uh, here we go. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established at the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. Many people will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we will walk in his path. So the world will come to learn about who God is and walk in his path. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations. He will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations will not take up sword against nation nor will they train for war anymore. The age to come will be marked by people having a knowledge of God. They will know how to live out God's way and there will be peace among the nations. Are you with me? Isaiah chapter 11, go a couple of verses away, a couple of chapters. Isaiah 11, let's read this. Uh, verse one, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. Jesse is the father of David. And all throughout the Old Testament, because Solomon didn't fulfill his obedience to God, there's prophecies about the one true son of David. The Messiah, Jesus Christ, comes from the line of David. He is the true son of David. Are you with me? Some of you are lost. It's okay. Don't worry. Uh, It probably won't make sense until three weeks from now. So just stay with me. Uh, The spirit of the Lord, listen to this. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. They're talking about a Messiah that's gonna come. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, and and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Now skip down. So that's the Messiah. That's referring to Jesus. And look at verse six. This is what's gonna happen. The wolf will live with the lamb 
The leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearlings together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den. The young child will put its hand in the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The Messiah that comes will be full of the Holy Spirit. There will be what is called shalom in creation once again peace and harmony with all of creation. That's what Isaiah is writing. Isaiah 26, verse one says this, in that day, and if you skip to verse 19, it says, but your dead will live. Lord, their bodies will rise. Let those who dwell in the dust wake up and shout for joy. Your dew is like the dew of the morning and the earth will give birth to her dead. On the, on the day of the Lord, the age to come, it will be marked with the resurrection of the dead. Jeremiah 31 Jeremiah 31, I'm just giving us context. We're going fast. Jeremiah 31, verse one. At that time, verse one, at that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel and they will be my people. At that time is referring to what? Day of the Lord, or you could say age to come. Just try to participate with me. <laughs> Do I need to stop? No. Seriously? No. This stuff is good. I know it's good. Because <laughs> the scripture is... Jesus in, in Luke chapter 24, when Jesus is resurrected from the dead, he's walking on the road to Emmaus. It says before they know it's Jesus, that he explained through all of the scriptures and the prophets, all that was pointing to him. This is what he probably talked about how the prophets were talking about him and pointing to what he was about to do. And so I love this stuff because it's rooted in history. And it's so life-giving. Look at what Jeremiah 31 says. Uh, let's look at verse 31. The days are coming, declares the Lord. And this is such good news. When I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and the people of Judah, I, it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them out, out of Egypt um, because they broke my covenant, though, though I was their husband. This is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their hearts and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they need to be taught or teach their neighbor and say to one another, know the Lord, because they will know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Think about the Old Testament sacrificial system. The way you knew them, the way you knew God was obeying the 613 laws of the Old Testament. The way you sought forgiveness was through sacrifice over and over again. And God says, I'll forgive them once and for all. Ezekiel 36. I told you, Old Testament survey. Ezekiel 36, 24. I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities, from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my commands and laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors and be my people and I will be your God and I will save you from all cleanliness. Jesus comes about and he says, the time where new hearts, new spirits, the, uh, where, where those of you that have been so callous to life and harmed by pain that your heart has become stone, I will give you a heart of flesh. That's now. That's here. That's at your fingertips, Jesus is saying. This is the fulfillment and a time that will be marked by the Holy Spirit. Don't even go there. Daniel talks about the kingdom of God being established over all the nations. And then Joel chapter two says this, and afterwards I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. People of God will be full of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus comes and says the time has come, he's saying a time marked with peace and justice and harmony, peace to the nations, joy and healing, the resurrection, new covenant, God's law being on our hearts, new hearts, the forgiveness of sins, a new spirit, God's kingdom being established and the people of God being filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus comes and he says, it's here. It's happening. 
right now, and it will continue to happen. All that you've been waiting for is here. Let's do this. Everything that you've been anticipating as a people is here. Let us do this. So when it comes to understanding who Jesus really is and what his message really was, we have to understand that it's told in a greater story, in a bigger context than just some random guy walking around the street saying, repent and believe the gospel. Because the gospel only makes sense in its context. It's why Paul says of first importance, the Messiah died for our sins and has been raised from the dead. When he says Messiah, he's saying the entire Old Testament is being fulfilled in Christ. Now, I already apologized and disclaimed for this heavy insight, but I want you to see the beauty of what we're proclaiming. I want you to see and understand the significance of Jesus's message. That when you really come to this, when you come to understand the context, what you're looking for is actually really, really good news. Next week, we're going to talk about where this plays itself out in what Jesus calls the kingdom. So we stop here with a greater context and a greater story, and I leave you hanging on purpose. It has no resolution on purpose because the resolution can only come when you hear what the kingdom is about and respond with repentance and belief. I want to leave you hanging on purpose because Jesus will say over and over again when he preaches, well, it's for those who have ears to hear and eyes to see. In other words, some of you are really going to get it. Some of you aren't. And he's okay with that because for him, This whole thing is a reality to be experienced. It's like a symphony to be heard. It's like a painting to witness. It's about a life in process and journey. The only way you're going to get it is by experiencing it for yourself.